Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, welcome to the works. I'm Keith. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the author showcase. I'm getting my podcast mixed up. Uh, I'm Keith Williams, your host, and this is the show where we we showcase book authors, bloggers, video bloggers, and publishers. And today we have Darren Kirby with us today. Uh, he is a published author, successful book publishing coach. How are you doing today? Welcome to our welcome to our show today. Um, Misty, can you can you, uh, uh, can you hear us? I can hear you. I, I think the connection isn't the greatest right now, and I'm not sure if it's on my end or if it's something else. Okay, uh, everything's good on my end. I'm I'm not having any problems. Uh, so if you need to turn off your video, you can do that. Uh, sometimes that helps. Well, if that's all right, let, let me let me try halting the, my video once, and we'll see how it goes here. See if that clears anything up for me. Okay. Uh, how how is it? That I think does help. I think it helps on on my end for the feed. So if you're good with it, let, let's go forward. Yeah, I'm 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 good. Uh, so we have Darren Kirby here, uh, published author, successful book publishing coach. Um, good evening. How are you doing today? I'm doing great today. It's a, it's a it was a beautiful sunny day here in the northwest Wisconsin. So we took advantage of it since a couple of weeks ago we had about a half inch of snow. A half an inch of snow in October. In October, it it, it does happen from time to time. Yeah, um, I kind of imagine that, uh, you know, being so close to uh, Canada, you know, that's where, you know, we get all those uh, uh, super cold uh, snaps from. So I'm not surprised. Uh, so Darren, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and, you know, what you do. Um, we also have a couple of books here from uh, Pins and Dolls to the Ritual and Coordinates for Murder. We'll be talking about those. So, uh, so for now, just uh, let everyone know who you are and what you do. Well, sure. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a published author. I've been writing for probably the last 14 years. Um, I really got into it when uh, Amazon first came out with their first version of the Kindle, and that uh, my myself and several other writer friends in in my area, uh, we all got together and started meeting as a group, and it kind of took off from there. So, as you mentioned, I've got a I've got a novel, uh, Coordinates for Murder is the novel, uh, several short stories which you named off a, a couple of them. Uh, I've more recently I've gotten into nonfiction books, uh, specifically in the outdoor uh, arena. Uh, my myself and my wife we love to go tent camping. Uh, have been doing it, uh, you know, since we were both kids. So we're looking at thirty plus years of of doing tent camping. And so I've written a tent camping guide for those who want to get into it or who want to do better at it. Uh, I've also written some outdoor. Uh, recipe books. I've compiled those for Dutch oven, pie iron, and tin foil uh, recipes that way. Um, but along with being a, a published author, like like you mentioned, I work I work with plenty of other authors as a book coach, uh, and I, I love helping those people really bring their stories to life. Um, it, and and everyone is different in in the needs that they have. So I don't have a, a cookie cutter approach. Uh, as a book coach, I really work with them individually to help them work on their project in the right way that the project needs. Uh, sometimes that's uh, a little more guidance than, than anything else. Other times, 
I'll be taking on a role of uh, doing book layout, doing editing, things like that. Uh, and even more recently, I, I've taken on, uh, I am the now copy editor, uh, book design and layout for a small publishing company out of Tennessee. Um, and of course, the name right now escapes me. So if I wanted to tell you what it was, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> okay. I just started that and uh, I've got some other writing things. So everything I'm doing now is kind of centered around writing, whether that's doing it for myself, uh, doing it for other people, coaching other people. Uh, it's all about writing at this point in my life. Um, do you have like any like uh, published authors that you look up to or have inspired you to to write on your own? Gosh, that's a that's a great question. The one that I loved reading even as a kid um, was Stephen King, and I just I, I love the the horror thriller genre that he writes in and i loved reading his book he put it out several years ago now uh, the book he titled on writing and it was really a very very good uh, description of what writing is like for anyone who who doesn't know the writing process um, he really breaks down a whole lot of good detail in there and the writing process can be very very solitary uh, for many people uh, which you know, has its pluses and minuses. Um, but he certainly is one that I have enjoyed reading for many, many years and kind of look up to and say, this is, you know, he figured it out and it wasn't always easy. And he certainly had his share of, of setbacks in, in life. But uh, if there's one that I could point to that really uh, means a lot to me, it's him. Uh, uh, according to your bio here on your website uh other people that you mentioned here is uh uh tom clancy and john gershon yeah i love uh tom clancy is for anyone who's read tom clancy you know that what he details in his books when he was when he was putting those together they are highly detailed technical explanations of what was going on uh, with specific military hardware and uh, other personnel. Uh, and in fact, my, my grandfather really loved reading Tom Clancy just for that reason. And so he's one that always blows me away uh, with just, again, the, the technical specifications and, and talk that he would uh, integrate into his books. And of course he knew so many people in the military um and in, in, and uh, i think we are having i think we are having an issue here with uh i think we're having an issue here with uh darren kirby here um are you still there I think we're having, uh, I think we're having, uh, I think we're having some sort of an issue here. Uh, so they kind of give me an idea of some of his, uh, his books. We have uh, uh, Pins and Dolls, uh, which is uh, his first short story and uh, coordinates of murder is his first novel, as well as uh, then he has uh, the ritual, which is a second uh, short story, and he's currently working on other uh, numerous of uh, other fictional titles. Um, let's see if we can get him back on here. Are you able to hear me? Uh, yep. All right. So, what? Where should I pick up again here? Um, my next my question, question would be. 
and I'm kind of getting it. So maybe I need to turn on my video too. Uh, hold on. Sure. Uh, my next question would be, uh, how did you get into writing? How did I get into writing? Uh, that, I, I've always been a reader. And um, for many years, you know, when, when I was in, in my teens and such, uh, I always thought being an author was some it was like a mysterious type of, of uh, profession that I just, the, the, you know, the authors had something that I would never have. Um, and so I didn't give it a whole lot of thought when I was, you know, a, a youth. But then about, I want to say 14, 15 years ago, uh, I had, my wife and I ran a coffee house in our, our small town. And every month I would try to have uh, different regional authors come in to talk about their latest book, um, give a reading, sell some books, that kind of stuff. And over that time, I met with, uh, there's a lady who had come in several times for different authors. And I remember it was about the time that we were getting ready to close the shop. She had asked one of the last authors we had, how would you go about like starting or getting into a writer's critique group? Um, because there wasn't one around there. And the author looked at her and, and said, well, why don't you start one? You can't find one. And after the author had left, I talked to the lady who's a good friend of mine now. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm looking to actually get into writing. What if we started a group together? So that's what we did. We ended up starting a small writing group together with, well, there's might've been a half a dozen people at the time. Um, and we just, we started writing. I started writing short stories and from there moved into writing my novel, Coordinates for Murder, and it kind of took off from, from that point on. Uh, what, what are some, uh, who are some of your, uh, who would you say is your audience? Well, because I write both fiction and nonfiction, um, I've got kind of a couple of different audiences. Um, for the fiction, I'm looking at like the, the, the person who loves thriller and horror um, kind of mixed together. They want that suspense. Um, they want that. They don't want to know what's coming next and they want to be surprised. Um, that's, that's kind of the person that, that, I'm, that I'm after. For the nonfiction, it, you know, I'm, a lot of it is people who are already in the outdoors. They're already going camping, they're four-wheeling, hunting, um, that sort of stuff. But they're looking for, especially with my recipe books, they're looking for something different uh, that isn't the same old, same old that they're, you know, they always had grown up with. And they have a very limited, you know, repertoire of recipes for outdoor use. So those are, those kind of people are what I'm after for for the recipe books. And with my, my tin camping guide, I think it's really important to get people into the outdoors, no matter what it is. If it's swimming, hiking, fishing, camping, um, there, there's being outdoors is so beneficial to one state of mind and one's health that I really want to get people in the outdoors. So I'm, I'm trying to help them by giving them, you know, distilling my decades of, of experience, distilling that down to usable information that they can then, you know, read a little bit in my book and then go out and act upon that. Whether that's getting, you know, going through the gear they have and taking an inventory to do better, or just looking at at borrowing some some equipment from some some friends to who already do it and say, hey, you know, teach me how to do this. You know, let me go uh, with you. And in fact, that's what we did earlier this, this summer and fall is I introduced a, a good friend of mine to recreational camping uh, in a tent. And he, it turns out he really enjoys it. And now he and I are actually planning a very, a, a three week long excursion driving through Canada into Alaska 
uh, for a three week driving trip. So, and we're going to be camping all along the way. Uh, so let's get into some of the books that uh, you have written. Uh, the first one uh, is the novel Coordinates for Murder. Uh, what is that about? That, that book really centers on uh, two friends who they, they work together, but they also love to go camping. And specifically when they're out camping, they like to take part in an activity uh, known as, as geocaching, and which is essentially a high-tech treasure hunt. So in, in the novel, they travel into the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest uh, in the northern part of Wisconsin, where they have found, just before they leave, they found a brand new geocache that they want to be the very first people to find. And that's something that in the geocaching world, being the first to find a new cache is kind of a, a badge of honor. So they want to go out and find this. And what it turns into is it's actually a multi-cache. So the first one they find will give them coordinates to lead them to a second cache, which hopefully then will have coordinates to lead them to a third one. So it's this series of, of caches that they're going after. What they don't realize is that somebody planted all of these on purpose to lead them deeper and deeper into the woods, kind of setting the trap as it were uh, by using uh, geocaches. And at that point, when, about the time that they realize what's going on, they're in too deep. And now it's a fight for survival in the Northwoods all alone. And it, uh, it really takes a fun ride. What, what kind of genre are we looking at here? This is, is kind of more of a thriller genre for this. Okay. Um, is, is, is there going to be like a sequel or something to this? I, I have considered writing a sequel for it. I do have kind of an outline uh, for a sequel that broadens the geographic area that, that it takes place in and and the person who does all this, all this kind of nasty stuff, he isn't alone. He isn't acting alone. There's actually a bigger universe that he's part of um, that I kind of am looking at exploring in a sequel to it. Yes. Okay. Um, next, we will uh, talk about uh, Pins and Dolls, uh, a short story. Uh, what is that about? This one is, is kind of different, um, and I, I don't remember exactly how it was that I, I kind of came up with this idea. I might have been uh, reading about or watching some stuff down in like, you know, that takes place in Louisiana. That's where I got the idea from, and it's the short story centers around um, voodoo dolls, of all things, and what what you can do and what somebody chooses to do with a voodoo doll, especially if that actually um, starts affecting people in real life. And I had to do some research on this to find out because there is some actual, um, there is strategy involved. If you're, if you're going to, to, to do, use a voodoo doll, there are actually different colored pins that you use for uh, affecting somebody, both positively and negatively. And um, it, it ends up where one of the characters starts kind of playing around with this and some of the bad results ultimately uh, happen and it happens to a person that they didn't expect. So it it, it really kind of, you know, it gets you going on this, like, why? Why did they do this? And, and what happened? And, you know, can, can you bring them back? You also have uh, uh, some similar stories uh, in a collection of short stories entitled, Sometimes, you know, They Scream. And I'm looking at the 
the cover, you know, of this book, and it looked like something coming out of the movie Psycho, uh, starring Anthony Perkins. <laughs> I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty cool. Uh, so in these, uh, so some of the stories here, you got Frequency, The Ritual, A Push Too Far, and Two Inches of Revenge. And all of these fall under like the, the thriller, horror category. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And, and um, also, you got exactly what I was going for with the cover of this collection you know so again something out of kind of psycho uh type imagery yeah i, I saw that and i was like oh my goodness the, the base motel you know that that, <laughs> exactly. that that creepy sign you know and the fact that it's like in black and white you know just makes it more creep it makes it a creepier mm -hmm. you know that is in black and white uh, kind of similar to the uh, 1968 film, uh, Night of the Living Dead, which kind of like uh, set the standard for, you know, the horror slasher film genre. So I thought that that's, that's what came to mind when I saw this, uh, you know, this cover. Now, you know, there have been some controversies around, you know, airing Psycho actually on TV. Uh, back in the late 60s. Uh, you know, I wasn't born during that time, but, you know, I, you know, used to be a TV junk. So, folks, what happened was is that uh, right around the time that this movie was supposed to air, uh, the daughter of a senatorial candidate in Illinois was killed in a vulnerable state. Now, in the movie, uh, the girl played by Janet Lee was actually killed while taking a shower. She was brutally stabbed where the, the senatorial candidate's daughter was killed while she was asleep. And a lot of people thought there was, you know, similarities, you know, to that. And so, mm. you know, they was like, they didn't want to air the film and the film basically got you know, yanked from the schedule and it was never aired on the network, uh, which was CBS. So they never, you know, they never aired it. It ended up being aired uh, on independent stations. Okay. Just start, wow. Yeah, just start, I, you know, brought that up because when I'm looking at this cover, you know, all of that came, you, you know, came to mind. And so, you know, during that time, people was experiencing, you know, a real life Stephen King you know, a fact, and that was before he ever became famous. Right, exactly. You know, right. So he came into, uh, so he came to fame when, uh, you know, he uh, directed uh, his first movie called Duel in 1971, uh, which was so popular on network TV that it eventually was released in the theaters. And so that's the movie that put Stephen King you know, on the map, and that's all she wrote. So this is kind of, so it appears to me that, you know, that some of your writings, you know, when you describe it, you know, kind of follows, you know, some of the people that you had admired or looked up to, uh, that tends to happen uh, with writers. You, you know, with writers, they, you know, they are influenced by a popular, you know, you know, author and they kind of like, you know, put their own spin on the people that they ad admire. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, common. But then you also have those authors that is, it, they're just straight, you know, unique. You know, they have their own, you know, style of writing. They, they have their own, uh, writing philosophy you know they kind of put themselves into what they write so they have their own you know imaginations uh kind of what you know the writers that you mentioned on your website you know uh and then sometimes you have authors that that will put a different spin on the people that they admire so i, I thought that was very important uh 
you know, to mention, because again, I'm looking at this uh, cover here and, and that's what came to mind. This is straight Alfred Hitchcock, Stephen King, you know, kind of thing, you know, going on, uh, you know, bringing, you know, that type of enthusiasm and imagination to, to uh, the next generation. It's pretty cool. I appreciate you saying that. That's, you know, you, you hit everything of what was going through my mind. A lot of what was going through my mind when I was designing the cover for this. So thank you. Oh, so, and uh, we even got a, so we even got a, uh, we even got a, a collection of crossword puzzles here. That's true. I, I did that, you know, kind of, as a, uh, I, I just wanted to do it. I wanted to try it. And so I put together a, a word find book um, that kind of did double duty. I, I, I like history. And so with that book, I ended up doing a little bit of history in terms of like the, the governors of each of the 50 states, um, as well as cities and stuff. So there's a little bit of history in there. And, and so I, I wanted to try my hand at, hey, let's, let's put one of these together for fun. So that's, that's where that came out of. Uh, uh, yeah, um, also to, uh, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm looking on your website, you know, um, for technical reasons, you know, uh, uh, video is not on, so you're not gonna be able to see, you know, what I see. Uh, uh, but you also have, a nonfiction book, Introduction to Coin, you know, collecting. Now I read somewhere that uh, that like if you have a penny from 1999, that that's worth a lot of money. Do you hear anything about that? Not from 99, um, though I'd have to, um, I would have to look, do some research myself on that. Yeah, it was, uh, that was kind of floating around. I wasn't too sure, you know, you know about that. But uh, it looks like you are into coin collecting. Is that true? Yes, very much. Uh, both okay. coin and, and note collecting. So, what what kind of coins do you collect? Um, I've got a, a big variety, both domestic and and foreign. And I really love collecting the foreign. Uh, coins from all over the world because it gives you an insight into what each country finds valuable uh, or what they find important. Now that that could be the, the leader of the country, it could be um, different plants or animals, it could be some buildings, um, and every country is is different in that respect. So it's it, it gives you an insight into what they find important, uh, but it also draws out the history. Uh, when each of the coins was minted. Um, so whether that's, you know, some of the last coins in, in France or Italy to be minted before they switched over to the Euro uh, in 99-2000, or, you know, if it's older coins from Mexico or Canada, or some coins or notes from uh, the, the occupied war period in Japan, uh, they all have very interesting history. And again, that it goes to the to the history interest that I have as well. Um, you also a blogger too. Tell us a little bit about that. I do. I blog about tent camping and all things around it. Um, it's an area that I didn't think was served very well. I see tons of people talking about. Well, I'm going to be, you know, hiking the the Appalachian Trail, and I'm only going to have like six ounces of gear with me because they're traveling ultra light. Or on the other end. I've seen people have blogs about, yeah, I've got this million dollar uh, motor coach that I'm driving around the country and, and living in. And uh, it just, I've seen a lot of extremes, but I haven't seen much in the middle uh, for camping. And so I decided to, to focus on tent camping. That's why I started the Tenting Life uh, blog site. And so I, so I blog about all things kind of dealing with tent camping. It might be different gear. It might be doing, uh, doing a solo trip or just even simple stuff of, well, 
you you need to start a fire, but there might be there could be several ways to start the fire, especially if it's if you've got wet wood, if it's raining, you know, it's always good to have backups, multiple ways to do things. Um, otherwise, your camping trip really can go downhill fast. Uh, do you have any camping stories of your own? You know what? There's there's one camping story that it still amazes me to to this day. Um, talking about raccoons, and at least here in northern Wisconsin, we we tend to have a lot of them, and they tend to have personalities and. Um, you know, we'll let you know if they're displeased with something to the point where uh, we were camping at a state park uh, a little north of where I, where we live. And on the first night, I could hear them. Uh, they had climbed up the back of my pickup truck, gotten on the, on the um, back bumper and then climbed into the bed of the pickup truck. We didn't have any covering for it. It was just wide open. We did have a, a, a bed liner in there and you could hear their nails kind of scratching on the bed liner as they scurried around and tried to check out stuff. Um, I had made a mistake in leaving something out. It, might, it probably was food, more than likely. And so they you know, got into that. I shushed them, shoot them away and put everything in the cab of the truck. Uh, slept the rest of the night, that's fine. The next night they come back and of course, I got smart this time. So I put everything in the cab of the truck before I went to bed. Could hear them climbing in the in the bed of the truck. They're scurrying around. There's nothing back there, so I'm not worried about it. The following morning, I wake up and look in the bed of the truck, and they were mad enough because I didn't leave them any treats. He basically pooed in the back of my truck to let me know he was disappointed. Oh wow! Yeah. That is crazy. There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. That's 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 that you know that's crazy. You never you never think that uh you know animals what you know will actually you know do that. You know, I know with you know you uh with bees, if you uh breathe too hard, they'll come after you. Yeah, you really got to be careful about them because they're they're very inquisitive and uh, and destructive at the same time. Uh, yeah, that's that's why I say the same thing about certain species of dogs. Mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah. too. Uh, you know, they will protect their turf. Very you true. know, and if you come into their space, they'll you know, they'll definitely uh, let you know that they're displeased. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, they will. Uh, so it looks like you wear a lot of hats. You are a published author. You are, you know, you're a blogger, and you're also a book coach. So, what is that like? You know, I, I really enjoy being a book coach and working with other authors to help bring their story ideas uh, to light to the market. Um, I've got pages and pages and pages of story ideas that I hope to get to in my life. And the things that I hear from the other authors that I work with on their ideas blow me away. I'm always excited to find out what they've got and to help them make it happen. Um, there's, there is no end to the creativity that I've come across with helping other writers. Uh, so that's that's one part that I, I thoroughly enjoy uh, is, is helping to bring their ideas to market. And, and that's really what it is. You know, every time I talk with a, a different author that I'm working with, I tell them they are the subject matter expert on what they're writing about. And that could be something that they completely made up. You know, they might have, um, you know, who knows, you know, very intelligent, you know, apes in space. And, you know, hey, they made this up. I, I don't, you know, it's it's fantasy, but they're the expert in the world that they're creating. Mm -hmm. So my job is to help them do as good a job as possible in in telling that story. And that could be providing some editing help. That could be doing some physical book layout it could be doing ebook layout uh it could be just you know let, let's talk about 
because good fantasy, good fiction is rooted in reality to a degree. And so you want to make sure, you know, let, let's run through some of this. Does this scenario seem plausible? Um, so there's a lot of, you know, plotting help sometimes and uh, character development sometimes uh, with stuff. And that's how I kind of approach book coaching is I'm here to help fill in all of these gaps that that you as uh, as the author don't have or aren't aware of. Because I've been doing this for you know 14 years, uh, I, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot, I've encountered all these different kinds of problems. So now I want to help these authors. Let's let's jump over these hurdles a little faster and get you to where you need to be. So is is it like a like a blueprint or something on you know how to go about you know writing a novel? Because uh, you mentioned something about character development and things of nature, that's kind of like the hardest part for me is like, you know, putting the characters, you know, describing the characters, putting the characters, you know, to, you know, together. Cause, mm -hmm. you know, I actually have an ideal for a novel. It's uh, actually a historical uh, fiction novel. It, it's the story of a, you know, it's a story of an uh, English, uh, uh, royal family who's in you know who's in turmoil they're divided uh and it is it's affecting you know how they rule the kingdom and and a foreign nation sees an opportunity you know for them to come you know come in and take over and mm -hmm. so you have mm -hmm. you know one individual in this family uh realized that it was a distraction and he, uh, you know, sought advice from someone outside of the kingdom. You know, hey, how can I, uh, you know, I'm dealing with this distraction. How can I, you know, how, you know, how can I, you know, defeat this other king who wants to come in and invade my territory? So it was a, so it was a lady out of uh, India. And this was set in the uh, the mid the early 19th century, and at that time, you know, mm -hmm. India was under British control. You know, mm -hmm. at that time, so of course you had some British people, you know, that live in India, and so this the this uh, this prince rather you know went to India for some you know advice, and he eventually took her back. You know, he took her back to England you know, to help defeat this, uh, you know, this corrupt king, you know, who wanted to bring his corruption, you know, to, you know, to England. And he had to uh, hold his family, you know, accountable saying, okay, you know, we need to get rid of all of this distractions and come together as a family or we're going to, you know, we're going to lose the kingdom. Kind of something similar to, you know, what happened in 1066 where William the Conqueror, who didn't, you know, who lived in France, another mm -hmm. country, came over and took over England. Exactly, yeah. And, and took over the country. Uh, so that's kind of like, uh, you know, the story that I have, but it's, it's, uh, it's historical fiction. And th those make great stories. Uh, a writer friend of mine, has, he just released, oh gosh, this spring, I want to say. He went back into history, uh, U.S. history, with uh, President Roosevelt, and, uh, Teddy Roosevelt in specific. And uh, he was part of the Rough Rider gang. And there was a connection he made through the years where his grandfather uh, the main character's grandfather served with Teddy Roosevelt uh, prior to when he was president uh, in the Rough Riders, and then jumped the story forward to this grandson who uh, was serving in the military and, and was overseas, um, you know, doing whatever he was doing. But it's it's very, it, it was, the little bit that I've read, I haven't actually read the whole book yet, but the little bit that, that he allowed me to read ahead of time. I was I was very impressed with and loved doing that. And 
you know, this sounds like the same thing. Again, you're, you're going back in history using actual locations and people and circumstances and then throwing in like, well, what if, what if this happened? And that's always a fun game to play when you start playing the what if game. Um, when you're trying to move a story forward or, you know, what would this character do if, you know, their, their spouse died in a horrible accident or something, you know, just kind of the more, the more out there you go, the more interesting the potential answers can be. And uh, that, that to me is, is part of the fun is kind of figuring out along the way, what's all going to happen. Now I call this, I call, I call this story uh, India Sorrow because mm. there was a rebellion going on, you know, in India at the time, which was under, you know, British control. It was part of the, you know, it's part of the, the king of the empire. And, you know, and they was in rebellion. And this, this royal family who lives in England, you know, obviously couldn't get themselves together. So you had a double win. You, you know, you had a devil whammy here. You have uh, India that's about to be invaded and you have England that's about to be, you know, about to be invaded. And uh, that that name came from the fact that uh, the, the India, which was under, you know, British control, you know, suffered terror. You know, su you know, suffered terribly. They was going through a rebellion, and that rebellion was like harshly, you know, you know, dealt with. It was, uh, it was, it was harshly, you, you know, you know, dealt with. So there was a lot of war. There was a lot of devastation. You know, and you know, and people was trying to, you know, leave any chance that they, you know, you know, they got. Uh, some of them was able to escape and some of them was not. But there was this one particular lady that the, the prince that I was telling you earlier had took a liking, you know, you know and, and he wanted to get her out of the, you know, of the, uh, the territory before the British forces come in and, you know, squash this rebellion. Uh, it was just like the... Uh, you know, just like the American Revolution, you know, you know, some of their own people, you know, were killed. So it was kind of, it was kind of similar, you know, to that, uh, you know, but I'm having a difficult time with this character development, you, you know, part, you know, I, you know, I know how the story begins and, you know, and how it ends, but the part that I get stuck is, you know, these individual characters, who are they? What's their personality? You know, how they're gonna react to certain situations. That's kind of like where I'm at right now, you know, with this story. For sure. And you'll probably have many interesting, unique characters. And for things like that, I personally have, have done, this is stuff that I've done and I've recommended to, uh, to other clients to say, look, you need to understand who these characters really are. And the only way to do that is to build their backstory. Um, the more that you can flesh out, you know, how they grew up, what their age is, what things do they like, what things do they wish they could do that they can't, um, give them some hopes and dreams and challenges and some of their personality too. You know, the more that you can understand what this person, this character in your head is like, are they belligerent? Are they, are they demure? Are they, you know, one who, you know, will, will tell you everything you want to hear uh, to your face, but then will turn around and stab you in the back, uh, you know, later on. And that way, all of that, there's so much in their backstory that will never make it onto the page, but it all influences how they interact with the other characters and what they may say or choose not to say uh, in different situations. So 
definitely building a character back sheet uh, on on the main characters. And the more that you need, you know, if you've got six six main characters, do them do them for all six. You know, um, that's going to help you kind of be able to to understand. Okay, in this situation, I've got them in an encounter somewhere. How are they going to relate to each other? And it might be very cordial. It could be antagonistic. You know, somebody could could walk into the room that they're going to be meeting with this other person immediately. You know, the proverbial knives are drawn uh, because they're they already have a, a could be false, but they have a, an image or a set idea in their head of what this other person's like, and they're not going to be taken advantage of. You know, no matter what's going on or however. Uh, how would they perceive the situation? So uh, the more you can understand about your characters, the better it's going to be uh, when it comes time to you know, putting them in different situations and with each other. Is, is there like any like tools or resources that I can use to kind of help me with that? Um, there, and I don't have any personally, I, I probably should. Uh, but there's uh, different places you can look for, like a, doing a character outline uh, for writing. And, and I somewhere I, I found that because I needed to do the same thing myself. So I've got one buried in one of my thumb drives uh, for a character development. And, and I do, all, it, it's very detailed. I want, I want their hair color, their eye color. I want their birthday. I want to know, like, how their parents were, are their parents living or dead? Did they have siblings? And this is a long run, this is a spreadsheet for the for each character. Um, because again, you know, some of this backstory that never makes it onto the page does affect how they go through life, which is exactly how it works in real life. You know, if if uh, if if I were if I didn't have the two parents that I have, if one of them passed away when I was 12 that's going to have an impact on me for the rest of my life in ways I can't even possibly fathom. Um, but it's, it's going to impact what happens. I might have abandonment issues. Uh, I could have other things that, you know, positive or negative based on these past events. Um, so again, the more that you can write down uh, about each character, the better off you'll be. As, as a uh, book coach, what kind of services do you offer? Mine is really kind of an a la carte uh, type offering. Um, a lot of I've seen before other people will offer packages of, you know, hey, if you'll get this kind of package, you'll get this and, you know, whatever else that is. I tailor mine to be very individualistic and I charge an hourly rate. So there are some things that I've worked with authors who are like, nope, I, I already have a perfect graphic design friend and I, they've got exactly what I want for a cover design. That's cool. Go do that. You know, that, that's already in place. No worries. Um, other people need that or want that help. And, and I can do that. I can pull in resources uh, that I've got, connections I've made over the years. So really it's, it's very individualized and we'll set up a schedule it could be we, we, we talk about things and, and work through issues once a week. It could be a couple of times a week. Uh, whatever really is, is needed uh, to get to the end point, which is finish the book, whatever that is, fiction or nonfiction, big or small, finish the book and get it out, get it published. That's the end goal, and that's what I work towards. Why should if people... Uh are in need of a book coach, why should they work with you? Well, number one, I've been in the industry for, like I said, about 14, 15 years now. Uh, I've been writing all kinds of different stuff from fiction to nonfiction. Uh, I've got plenty of author friends that write in different genres than I do, and I've even helped them on different aspects of some of the books that have come out, whether that's, you know, proofreading, copy editing, helping with book covers, um, you know, marketing help, uh, things like that. I've, I've got a, a depth of knowledge and experience that is, you know, 
frankly, not that easy to come by these days. Um, and I couple that with a business approach to writing books. Um, I've, I'm kind of an entrepreneur at heart, and I always look at every book an author puts out. I don't, I don't care if they put out 100 books before this one. This one that they're putting out is a brand new product that nobody has seen before, is untested in the market, and authors really are entrepreneurs in that sense. Um, I have both an undergrad and a master's degree in business administration, and I've done marketing for many years uh, in, with different companies in different industries. Um, so I've got a lot of different um, experiences and knowledge to draw from that, you know, bring to bear uh, just in, in unique and different ways. Um, a great example, there's, there's a, uh, an author in Southern California that I've been working with and uh, we'll catch back up with here. We kind of took a little break as he was in the midst of kind of changing his direction on, on the books that he was, he was going to put out. And he's worked with other book coaches in the past. And what he told me was, uh, after we'd been working for a few months, he's like, you're pointing out things that nobody else has and giving him different things to think about that nobody else had brought up. Uh, and that's what I bring. I bring a lot of experience and I make the authors really think about what they're doing so that the end product is as good as it can be. Well, we're going to uh, get ready to wrap up here. We want to uh, thank you, Darren, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Arthur Showcase. I appreciate you having me on. I always love talking about writing and being an author and things like that. So this is always fun. Uh, if someone wanted to get in contact with you or they would like to uh, take advantage of your services, how would they be able to reach you? Yeah, the very best way is to go to my website, darrenkirby.com. And on there, they can see the books that I've written, but then they can also look at, uh, I've got a section on book coaching on my website that talks about that. And they can get a hold of me through my website and uh, what I offer to every prospective coaching client is let's set up a time to have a phone call. We'll have an hour long call and they can ask me whatever they want. And I'll try, I will give them the best answer that I possibly can. And at the end, we'll, we'll talk about if it's something that we want to work together or not. Okay. Here are some uh, reviews from uh, Darren Kirby's novel, Coordinates for Murder. Um, great and unexpected story mind makes you feel like you are right there. Uh, here's another one. I am looking forward to the sequel. Uh, finally, his fresh perspective brings the story to an ending that you won't see coming. So this is the novel Coordinates for Murder. It is available uh, in ebook form and in paperback on Amazon and Barnes and no, just to give you an example. Great, yeah, thank you for, for reading those. It's, it's true, it's, I try and do something unique. And on my website, I've got a few different coaching clients and some comments from them, from working with them. So you can see that as well. Um, any advice for someone who wants to get into writing? What advice do you have? With a couple of things. Um, for those who want to get into writing, uh, best to be reading uh, as, as often and as much as possible. And um, I've been guilty as of late to, to not do as much reading as I should. And my wife is fortunately uh, pestering me to the point that I am reading more again like I should be. So reading is a huge thing that any writer needs to be doing regularly. And then the other important thing for somebody getting into writing is just sit down and, and start writing. It's not going to be great. Nobody is going to say, oh my gosh, this is the best writing I've ever read. It's not going to happen. And that's okay. 
we all need to start somewhere and you get better at it the more you do it. So the key is just start writing, do it as frequently as you can, daily if possible. Don't worry about word counts. Just start writing your ideas that are in your head on paper and go from there. Uh, I'm just kind of fascinated at this uh, premise for the uh, novel coordinates for uh, murder. Uh, in the premise, you know, it talks about a saddest monster named the Woods. And I thought, uh, where did I, you know, remember that from? And then I thought about this, uh, and I thought about this, you know, animated, uh, and I thought about this animated uh, Scooby-Doo movie. Uh, yeah, what was it called? Uh, uh, Camp Scare, you know, okay. where you had the same, uh, you had the same character named the Woodsman you know, but it turned out to be uh, a human in disguise. But this is, but this is, you know, this is kind of weird. You know, you know, this is real. If you look at the cover, you know, of this book, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like you in the woods, you know, you're wandering the woods, and you, you never know who or what's going to be peeping out of the woods. You know, it could be, you know, your life that's taken away from you from this, this, you know, this savage, you know, beast. It's, it's clearly horror classic, you know, and I just wanted to, you know, bring that out, you know, you know, before we close. Is anybody that's in the horror th thriller, uh, you know, genre will probably find this, uh, the you know, book to be not only fascinating, but, you, you know, unique in that, you know, that have that classic uh, scare factor that you expect from books of this type of genre. So I wanted to point that out as well. Yeah, thank you for doing that. And I'll, I'll add to that. And, and maybe you noticed on the cover, I do actually have GPS coordinates on there on the cover and they're legit coordinates oh yeah I, I yeah i you know i see that wow i mean that's like you, you know really unique and it kind of like puts some of uh you know some of the things you know some other things you know you know that you do like for example the 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 tent camping block you know that you have uh, i see some elements of that in the premise, you know, as well. So it's, it's definitely unique, but it also has like that, uh, you know, that classic scare factor that we expect from books in this genre. Um, so I do encourage you to, uh, you know, pick up a copy of this book, Coordinates for Murder. Again, it's available in paperback and ebook form on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Well, and that will end it up here for us today. I uh, hope that you will have an opportunity to uh, tune in archives with this great author uh, here. And we, of course, will have another great author with us on next Saturday. And we are also doing, uh, we're also be doing a, a series of, you know, a segments where we're showcasing authors of the past, uh, especially uh, African-American authors. Uh, we don't hear much about them. So we had a couple of segments on that. So we will continue that, you know, as well, as well as bringing, uh, authors, bloggers, and publishers from all over the world right here on the Author Showcase. I'm Keith Williams, your gracious host. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.